don't think they can't see me because I'm short. <laughs> So we're going to go ahead and get started back up again. Um, so we're going to continue on with the tutorial series, uh, better soft, better scientific software. And up next, we have Pat. Okay, I'm Pat Grubel. I'm from Los Alamos National Laboratory. I don't think anybody can't see me. <laughs> I'm a little short here. Um, I'm going to talk about collaborative software development. And oops, I need to learn how to use this. Okay, it's the big button. Again, our license. Um, we're going to talk about why we develop in a collaborative manner, and we'll touch a little bit on tools. And then uh, one of the tools that is uh, very essential is version control. We use Git for that. And I will talk about uh, building Git workflows, give you some examples, and think about what would be good for your Git workflow. Um, if you don't already have one, or maybe what you can include um, in one that you have that would help you. Uh, then we'll talk about using Agile uh, for scientific teams um, on developing software. And one of those tools is Kanban. I'll get into that somewhat. So if you haven't already started that type of process, you might be able to use that to help you, especially if you're getting started. Uh, and then we'll talk about, and David did talk about this somewhat, about the code review. Um, we'll talk about the importance of it and a little bit about how to do it. And through all of this, um, there are resources like David man, uh, mentioned that he put on that site, the very first slide, uh, and all the sites are actually there. So you don't have to go through the slides to find them if you're interested in this one. And last, I'll touch, talk a little bit about software licensing. And then at the back of the slide deck, um, there are some actual Git workflows that um, from different science uh, projects, including um, I think Trilinos and Open MPI and a software project called Flexi. So you could look at those and see what some of the real uh, science teams are using for their Git workflows. So why uh, develop software collaboratively? Well, most teams, um, most projects are actually manned by teams, um, not individuals even though sometimes you might have somebody that takes off and tries to do everything by themselves. <laughs> but um, so we collaboration has advantages. It can help um, make you get to the point where your software actually works quicker. Uh, the design is better because you're collaborating with people that have different experience uh, levels, both in maybe the science domain and in the uh, software uh, process uh, as far as uh, the technical uh, points. And it can even be enjoyable. Um, I know that at Los Alamos, we have a lot of teams that are now doing tea times. And in these tea times, they don't even uh, necessarily talk about the software. They come in with their little person. So they get to know each other. And then um, sometimes that migrates to actually solving problems at that time because they find somebody they wanted to talk to and they weren't able to do that. Now, that's not always possible when you're not co-located. So uh, that's one of the challenges. Um, for collaboration, a lot of our teams are now virtual. Um, they may be even across time zones that are across the world. So it, it becomes a real challenge. And so you have to have really good uh, ways of communicating. And that even goes for those who are co-located because sometimes people communicate in different manners. And so you need to make sure you have those channels available to them. So also collaborating um, making sure that everyone is working from the same version, that can be very difficult. So you need to set up rules for that and make sure that each uh, person can contribute equally. Uh, the other thing that collaboration, uh, can, um, when you're on a team, it can become hard to understand what other people are doing with their code. So you need to set up channels and make sure that you have a way of doing that and that they understand what was intended. Okay, so there are a lot of tools. We're going to touch on some of these, um, and there are many more. I just threw some up on there, just splattered them around a little bit. Um, but there are a lot of tools, and so one thing we want you to think about is what you need to use for your project or for yourself <laughs> that would help. So why do we need these tools? They help us keep organized. 
uh, when we're working on a team, and then even our individual work, we can um, stay better organized with them. Um, it keeps all the developers working on the same page and gives them the knowledge of what the work to be done may be, what your future goals are, and how that's going to happen. Uh, it helps you keep track of things like any kind of features that uh, are requested or bug fixes. These are the types of things that we use the tools for. Uh, it also helps you cap capture any type of in information for the collaborative process. Um, so one of the major tools, of course, is version control. We've talked, many people have talked about that in the last day and a half, and uh, we use Git. And so we're gonna talk more about using Git for version control. Um, so it's a means of tracking your changes to the source code and other parts of your project, even your documentation uh, and, and even your uh, analysis type processes can be put in version control. There are various hosting services, including GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket. And uh, so, but the main features of Git, uh, I'm gonna get a little basic here. So if you already know all this, uh, please excuse me, but there may be some people in the audience that don't. Um, the main features are branches, pull requests, clones, and forks. And so branches allow separate development uh, uh, for fixes on the same repo. And that can be by one person or um, multiple um, developers. And then pull requests enable the place where you can do a code review. And also, depending on your workflow, which I'll get into those, this can be a time where you can actually put up a pull request that maybe um, is not really ready, but you want to get other people's ideas on it. And also, at this point, is where you would want to make sure that you're testing procedures are in a good place so that um, you have not only the review, but testing before you merge into a main branch or uh, a, an important branch. Clones allow um, each developer to have their own copy on their own system or even multiple systems if they're maybe testing it out on different platforms. And then forks allow that anyone from outside, if you're an open source project, they can um, uh, fork your repository, and if they have some fix that they would like to see come back into you, they can collaborate with you on whether or not that could be put back into your uh, main repository. Uh, but we're going to talk mostly about the first two so we can get to um, coming up with a Git workflow for your project. So this just shows you a little example of um, version control and how you'll have a remote repository and then each developer could have their own local repository at which would have copies of everything in there plus maybe some of the work they've been doing. And then they can uh, put that work into the remote repository so it's in a safe place and other people can see it. And I'm not going for it. <laughs> okay, so again, the use of branches, this en enables you to have the independent development uh, on the same repo. Um, so you can have multiple developers developing and uh, doing things, uh, making new features, doing fixes, even maybe making up tests that are under the version control. And this also gives us a way of making different types of workflows. Uh, you can have protections for your main branch. And so the idea is that you develop on a branch, you test on that branch, and then it's reviewed and you make sure it works. Uh, before it's merged into main. And of course, integration occurs at the merge commence. So this is just a very simple diagram of what happens. You have a feature that you're working on. You may start out um, from main and work on your own branch and then put it back in. And you can see the second example where uh, the main branch might um, diverge as you were working on it. And then you would have to maybe if there's any conflicts, you would have to fix them before you merge it back in. But there are times, and I don't know if it shows up, that's actually a don't do this <laughs> symbol on there, but it's pretty faint. <laughs> anyway, um, so how do you make sure that you don't have this kind of complexity, um, which could be multiplied by the number of developers you have? <laughs> um, you need to have a workflow policy. So there are some things you could uh, look at this one and say, uh, you should name your features with a descriptive name. Stuff A and B don't tell you anything. 
Um, and then you should have some rules about where branches start and where they end. If you multiply this by several, even just a few developers, this could be very complex. And then you don't really need a complex uh, model unless until you've matured and you and at that time you can decide what kind of complexity you need to add to it and not um, just throw things out there. So think about using an issue tracking system and uh, your names should match that in some way uh, and come up with some of these rules that would help you. Okay, so the other thing that um, you can have with branches is you can have infinite lifetime branches um, besides name. So if you are uh, in a, if your project has a release type uh, scenario, you might have some infinite life branches that have uh, production, pre-production uh, names to them. You may have some um, <clears throat> a development uh, lifetime branch where you're doing all the development and it's not as stable as main. And, and in this case, you can see where these issues were put into development first and then at some point it was decided that they would go into main. And, and that's how you might keep a stable branch. Uh, there, you can decide what to name these and what is good for your project. And it helps signal to your users what they should be downloading when, and using. So how do we make sure? Oh, somehow I went backwards, sorry. <laughs> okay. So here's some strategies. You need to decide what is stable and under what conditions what tests are run on which branches and what the rules are with those. You may have some very, uh, you might have just some very sanit uh, continuous integration type tests that are just sanity checks. You may have some more rigorous tests that are done on a nightly basis. And you may even have some more uh, rigorous tests before you put something out into production or give it to your users. So you, you have to come up with that um, again you see these different lifetimes, the indefinite ones, the shorter term ones for features and fixes, and then some longer period times if you have like a release schedule um, and, at, and what you're gonna support. I mean, how far back do you wanna go back uh, as keeping those around? So you have to uh, establish these workflow policies to help you with your project. So the other um, feature with uh, Git are pull requests, and we use those. Those help you, I, I mentioned a little while ago, you could start early uh, with a pull request so that people can start seeing what your idea is and where you're going with it, and maybe you want some uh, comments on that. So this alerts your team and even users that there are some changes that we're, we're going to be making, um, and you can have discussions about that and have follow on commit. Or you can use the pull request to be something that you want to put in right now that you know is working, is, is improving your code. And even then, um, it gives others an opportunity to look at it and say, wait a minute, that's not what I meant by my feature request or, or whatever. It just gives you a time to review it. At this time, you can request particular reviewers. You may want to request somebody that has uh, the domain expertise, make sure you did uh, what they wanted, and, and uh, or um, you may want to give someone uh, knowledge about that part of the code if it's a very large project and they haven't worked on that part, uh, that might be a good time for them to look over that and, and start understanding more of it, or someone who's new on the project. So there's different uh, ways you can use this uh, reviewer request. Um, the other thing is you need to set policies for uh, merge. Uh, such as things for coding standards, uh, a minimum number of reviewers. You want to have at least one reviewer. Uh, you may want to have a science reviewer and a technical reviewer. Um, and then you can also, in uh, GitHub and GitLab, you can set up automatic protections that only certain people can merge into uh, certain branches. So what makes a good pull request? Um, this one is really close to my heart. I had a, a developer that was working on a piece of code for a long time, and it really turns out he really had too big of a pull request. So you wanna make sure it covers just one thing, 
and that it's independently manageable. Um, so the second point here, avoid large PRs, try to break them up to keep them small. And um, that goes in with the merge frequently. It helps to have, if they're smaller, you can merge them in frequently. Um, that helps because if you have a lot of people working on the software, their branches are uh, diverging as the commits are coming in. So the sooner you put them in, the sooner they can um, merge it into their own feature branch and uh, possibly take care of any, commit, uh, any conflicts that they would have in the future. Another thing is to make sure you have a good description in the pull request of what you're meaning for it to do. And that way, both reviewers and users can look at it and, and see if it's doing what you claim or, or what they wanted if it comes from something they requested. Okay, our next topic is Git workflows. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble with this. Okay, so a Git workflow consists of both the, your structure of your branches and the policies that you set up for your project. So you'd have your designated lifetime branches again. Um, they may be whatever you come up with. You may have um, main, production, pre-production, development, uh, feature branches. These are usually new features and bug fixes. And then if you have a uh, scheduled type uh, release schedule, then you all have that in your policies when you're going to do that and how those uh, tags or branches um, or the combination of them are named. And then you should have some rules for testing, what tests are going to be performed, uh, as, um, and then the branch protections, as I mentioned a minute ago. So there are three commonly known Git workflows that are kind of general and, and I'm going to show them to you and go a little bit in detail into them so you can kind of decide what would work well for your project. And again, at the end, you can look at these science projects and what they use. And then um, Ross Bartlett, who's a member of the ideas team, has this document uh, called Design Patterns for Git Workflows. And he really goes into some extensive discussion on them. So it's a very good source if you want to look and see uh, something that you could use to help your project. So the first Git workflow was Git flow. And you can see it's quite looks quite complex. Um, it's maybe hard to see some of this, but it has the main uh, branch and the develop branch. Uh, and this is designed for software that has official releases. And you may be in that category, so you may think about this. You can see that uh, if there's a hot fix, it would go into both of those branches because they want to make sure that they both work. Um, and then on your left, there are these uh, feature branches. And like I was mentioning before, you may have to, um, as you're making fixes in the development branch, you may want to update those branches before they go in there. Um, then on your release branch, this would be probably a not as long term. You may get to the point where um, you know you're going to put out a release and you want to make that more mature, make sure things are working the way you may be testing that in a different manner, making sure it works on all the platforms, that type of thing. And at some point, uh, you may tag, make a tag for that release and put that into your main. Um, so you have to think about um, how you have official releases and they use Git extensions to enforce the policies, and you can go to that site. Um, and then you have to determine how you synchronize main and develop in this type of scenario. And the uh, blog is on here, the site for it, if you want to look more into uh, what Vincent Dreisen had as an idea for it, all the particulars. Uh, next was uh, Git Hubflow, which was uh, published as an alternative to Git uh, flow and <clears throat> it didn't have a structured release schedule so it's a much simpler uh, workflow and it the idea with it is that it's got continuous deployment and continuous integration so all the all the commits in the main branch are deployable they make sure they're mature enough that they actually are deployed the idea here is that you push your changes quite often 
um, that's probably a good idea if you're working in a branch to do that. I know some people, and, and you need to make sure that your developers feel comfortable doing that. Sometimes they don't want people to look at their code early, but um, it really does save headaches if you lose something happens to your system. Or, uh, and also um, you could ask other people to look at it. And that case I was talking about where this developer waited a long time, that was one of the things he didn't do and we couldn't look at what he was doing and it, it became a problem. So it's, it's good if you can get them to push um, to the remote constantly. Um, and then the other idea with this scenario was to open up your pull requests early so that more people can uh, um, collaborate with the developer on what they're actually doing and have the dialogue start early on that. And uh, on all of these scenarios, usually you merge in the main after a review. So um, you not only have the initial and ongoing talks, but you have a code review. And the last one that's a general one is GitLab Flow. It's kind of in between the two. Um, and because it's set up for a semi-structured release schedule. So if you have any users, you usually need something where you can do this type of thing. Um, <clears throat> and it simplifies the synchronization between the infinite lifetime branches. So the idea here is that your main branch is a staging area, and then the mature code in uh, main is picked off and um, flows downstream into your pre-production and production uh, infinite lifetime branches. So this allows for you to have releases that go into a downstream flow. You, you make your fixes and features in your main and then decide when to deploy them and on what, what your schedule is. So those are the three general ones, but what do I do to decide what, how to establish my get workflow? Well, what, some of the things you need to do are you need to communicate it to all your collaborators. And so put it, your workflow description in your contributing guide so they'll know what they should use. Um, establish the conventions for branch naming. That should all go into that contributor guide. Do you wanna do it by issues or are you going to have minor and, and major versions? If you look at some of the uh, examples in the extra slides, you'll see that they use that in some of those workflows. Um, then you need to enforce different things, uh, the workflow with branch protections. Like I said, you could do that automatically on, on the, uh, some of the menus. And then uh, that would help you with limiting who can push and uh, who can merge. And then you would, should have testing and review requirements. Uh, but we don't want you to think of this as a really hard process. Think about your team culture and what would be acceptable to them, what's feasible with them. Um, start out simple and build up. And yeah, I know that we've had discussions with uh, side discussions with people where we have sometimes we have domain scientists that um, don't want to go along with this. I would we taught uh, get workflows. Well, it was just get really for some scientists and they were there were a few of them that I'm only here because I have to be but I think they've come around now to understand that this type of thing helps them so if you can um, give them some things that will be acceptable at first and build up to their confidence and, and working with you in this way and then you can add the complexity when you need it so another thing that helps with your, um, your software development teams is to use Agile. And so we're gonna talk about that. Um, this fits the research experience because often we don't know uh, where, where we're going. Sometimes things change and we need to be able to adopt to it. But the way heavier weight approaches that might be um, in some of the processes don't fit well with these types of teams and with the small teams. So what you need to do is be able to be flexible. And that's one of why we suggest using Agile and then tailor it to your team. So it, this works well for small teams um, and it can provide uh, the structure 
that will produce all the things that we're talking about in this tutorial, productivity, even productization, uh, sustainability, flexibility, because your requirements change as science changes as we learn more things. And then of course, communication is key when you're working in a team. So what is Agile? So it's not a software development life cycle model, um, but there are some misconceptions. You'll hear people saying, I don't really write documentation. I don't do formal requirements. I don't design or really test. Well, we're not suggesting that they should be able to use any of the excuses uh, to do sloppy work. Um, what we want to do is, is be flexible and be able to do the things that we need to do, as David mentioned earlier, to look at the short-term goal for your science and longer term. Um, you want to be flexible, but you want to have those goals so that your software will be sustainable and uh, also be productive at the same time. So sometimes they uh, say that Scrum and Agile are, the, are synonymous, but they're not. Um, so it's kind of like a uh, square and a rectangle. Scrum is agile. Agile is not only Scrum. And it's not Kanban either, but Kanban is a good place where you can get started. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Kanban and so that those of you who haven't used it can get started with it. <laughs> I may talk about it without the slides <laughs> um, in a minute. But in the meantime, I want to if you want to look into more about what Agile is, there's this manifesto for Agile development. And right above the red box, you see four uh, lines that have the key elements. And you can see that the left side is in bold and larger print. And that's because we emphasize those things on the left side over the things on the right side, such as um, comprehensive documentation, the second line is important but it's not as important, as important as having working software. It's not that we ignore it, but we do need to emphasize working software over it. Uh, the same with um, your processes and tools. You need to emphasize the, the, what the individuals and the interactions are on your team over forcing to use a certain tool. <laughs> so how would you get started? Well, these are not hard and fast rules. So what you wanna do is adopt a few agile processes and you don't wanna look at another team and see, hey, they're working really well with that process, pick that up and find out it doesn't fit your team at all. You might wanna pick a few things that you see that they're doing and see if you can um, do that, use them to improve your processes. And if you haven't, Kanban, Kanban is a good starting framework. Uh, you can follow basic principles on it and you can add some of the practices when it becomes advantageous for your team. Uh, that's better than taking a scrum, scrum type process that doesn't fit your team well and trying to remove parts from it. So let's get a little bit more into Kanban. This is a basic Kanban. Usually you have columns with tasks in them. Um, this is the very basic one with a backlog. Those tasks would flow into the ready when they're ready to be developed. Uh, and then you have your in progress and completed tasks. Now, I always like to have another one over here that shows things that were recently completed because it's nice to see like what we've been doing uh, in the, just in a short period of time than having something that's really long. But the, the big key here is that you don't wanna have too many in progress tasks. Think about what you can tolerate on your team um, and you can add all sorts of other columns. If you have a personal Kanban and you're a student, you might want to have a column that says waiting on advisor <laughs> confirmation uh, to do, or you might have one that's under review. So you're waiting on that, but you can go work on something else in the meantime. Uh, you may have a block column. And this gives you a visual picture of what is going on with your project. And it can give for all the team members. Um, there are different ways to do Kanban. You can use a blackboard. You can use sticky notes. Uh, I had a um, just a, a meeting where we were just throwing out ideas and we did sticky notes on a blackboard and then I took all the sticky mo notes back and put it on a real board. But it made it real fast to do. It was just an idea meeting. Um, so you 
the big thing again is you want to limit the number of in progress tasks and a common convention is to use two times n minus one for the and uh, where n's the number of team members and then uh, but each team can look at this uh, one thing that this helps with is uh, in an r d setting um, it avoids deadline approach and you can handle those in a different way so that um, you, you can continually work on things without too much worry about that. Um, <clears throat> and what you want to do is optimize the flexibility of your team members and not have too much uh, swap overhead. At my lab, most of us are on uh, different projects, and it really helps to have these Kanban boards so we can, I, I can jump from one to another and see what I was working on and what I need to work on. And also, I can, uh, any team member can say, you know, you have me assigned to these four in-process process, uh, tasks, and I can't do all of them. Which one is a priority? There's things that you can use this for. So it provides a view uh, to manage all your issues. Uh, there's a lot of tools, like I said. Did I get past this? Um, yeah. There's your whiteboard, blackboard. And then there's a lot of software tools. Uh, most of my projects use GitHub or GitLab issues because uh, there's a project board on those and you can actually put your issues on them and you can put extra cards on there if they aren't really issues. Uh, and, um, but then there's Trello, which is really nice because uh, it's, a lot of people use it for maybe personal Kanbans because you can check it anywhere. You can check it on your computer. You can check it on your phone so you can work anywhere. You might not want to use Trello if you don't want to be <laughs> accessible at all times, but <laughs> it's a good idea for, for some purposes. Uh, so the big question is, how many tasks should I have? How many active tasks should I have? And there's no real single answer for anyone, um, but for your team, choose something. And if it gets too busy, then then back off, or if it's not enough, you can add some. So think about the go home traffic. It's usually uh, no one's going anywhere. <laughs> You're in a long line. Uh, it the same thing happens with your effectiveness if you have lots of active tasks. Um, so the other thing is to spend a lot of time consulting the board. This brings focus to what you're doing. Um, and you can actually do retrospectives by looking at what's been done. That's why I like that little column with recently completed because I can look at it, especially on my personal Kanban board. And I go, oh, I did do something this week. Um, and you can use your Slack time effectively or your developers. They might be able to go to the grab bag column or the ideas column and say, hey, I have some time to work on that right now. Um, or I have this in progress task that I could be working on right now. A lot of times you'll get out of the habit. That's okay. You can just start up again and, and make sure your team members do that too. And uh, the other thing the board does is it does uh, steer you towards things that you started and you may have put on the back burner that you need to get back to. So the next thing is code review. This is very important. And we have a lot of resources that you can look at for it. Um, what does pure code review provide for you, uh, provide for your team? So it allows discussion. I mentioned that when I talked about putting PRs up earlier. Um, it can be discussion for understanding the code um, and you can actually have iterations on it to make the code even better than it was when it was proposed. Um, you can also at this point make sure that the request or the bug was actually fixed and uh, was meant to do, uh, does what it was meant to do. Um, it, you can evaluate how this new code might break other parts of your code, the interfaces, and that type of thing. And then um, at this point, you can also make sure that your code guidelines have been followed. And this helps improve practices. Uh, people who are doing the code review can learn from it. Um, they could possibly, if they're a, a new software developer, they may learn from the review what they could do to improve what they've been doing. and. Uh, also, um, if there's helpful coding techniques that they weren't aware of before, they may uh, learn them. And um, we have the site, you have uh, how to code review and a pull request could be very helpful. The blog. <laughs> um, 
So there's some practices that you can do that will improve your code review, um, make the process formal with the structured guidelines for it. And we talked, someone talked earlier about trying to um, estimate time, make sure you put in some time for the code review process. Uh, a lot of times we think, oh, I'll just make this code and you do your time estimates and you don't think about that. That's a, that, that does take time, the review itself, and then any changes that might go on because of it. Um, and I said, mentioned a little while ago, make sure you have, if you need it, a science review and one technical review. Um, make sure that you, if you're the reviewer, that you get to it in a timely fashion. Um, and that way things can progress and um, things don't get out of sync as much. Um, also, two important points here. I think we talked, touched, David talked, touched a little bit on it when we were talking about maybe talking to a scientist or something about their code with the documentation problem. Um, if you train your reviewers on how to phrase the feedback so it doesn't come out as a criticism of the person, you know, it's supposed to be helpful review comments. And then you also need to train some of your developers, whether it's a software developer or um, maybe a domain scientist, on how to accept those comments that are meant to improve their code. It's not a comment, a criticism of you, but so these are two important points and they're not easy. They, it's part of the social uh, aspect of software development in a team. Um, you could use automatic code review tools, but if you're doing that, you might want to make sure that you train your reviewers on how best to use them. And we have these two webinars um, on code review practices and investing in code reviews that could help you. And last, I'm going to touch on software licensing. I think I'm pretty good on time here. Um, I'm not going to go into it too deeply, uh, but we do have some um, sources here that you can look into, uh, some references. But just remember that anything you write is really copyrighted and it, uh, all rights are actually reserved. Usually it's your employer or your institution that owns the copyright. Uh, the best thing you can do is specify a license so that uh, it's you, that others know how they can contribute to it or use it. And uh, so just treat the license as a tool. It is important to have. It's probably important that you don't make up your own. Um, there's this open source initiative that has approved licenses for open source licenses. And then there's this tool that you could use to choose your license. Um, and so we have those sites there. Make sure it's clearly expressed if uh, your license is in your code repository somewhere um, and easy to see. <laughs> And anyway, for more information, you can see this uh, webinar on introduction to software licensing gets into more detail. And that's all I have. If you have any questions, oh, no way. I, I have the extra slides here, but I don't think I really have time to get into them, um, but they're there for your information and you can go to their sites and look a little bit more about those projects. Does anybody have any questions? Actually, before we get to questions, I just wanted to briefly mention that Tasia sent out an email to everybody that contains some extra information from the people running the tutorial. So please check that out. It's got some great information in it. If you go to the microphone. A lot of great information that we have been trying to apply in our scientific software setting for quite some time where we're using um, a lot of Git flow with, with forks um, and hosting forks at our institution level so that our scientists can collaborate in branches and, and really get the, the scientific process going there. Uh, but what we're finding is that we often get really stale old branches with lots of new great things in them and can't convince the scientists to bring in new changes regularly. And I'm curious if you have any suggestions on how to encourage that process to kind of keep up to date with those future branches, get them back into develop before, before they're scientifically ready maybe, um, or if, 
if you found any tricks, that would be helpful to, <laughs> it, helpful to know. It is difficult when they're working from forks because they feel like they have their own repository and they're not, they don't always keep that up. So um, I don't know if you put out a release, release notes to them or, you know, you keep them, try to keep them up to speed. Um, if some of those teams are at your institution, if you want to let them be on the actual repo and have less privileges, that might be helpful. Um, yeah, we've done this thing that we haven't really seen others do because this whole unified forecasting system thing has many different authoritative repositories. So we're keeping forks at our institution level that aren't the main uh, right. repository so that we can facilitate collaboration. We just can't quite get them on board with letting us do that update to something that may change their answer while, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's difficult. I, I haven't really come across, I don't work on something that's at that level, um, but I, I'm sure there are others out there that have experience with that. I, that seems like a painful thing, but just all you can do is encourage them to keep up with it. Um, anybody else have any suggestions on that? Are there testing strategies that might help give people confidence that maybe they don't have to do many? Um, so let me repeat that in case the people online didn't hear it. Um, he was suggesting that um, if there were testing strategies that help people keep up with that. We have considered setting up automated testing in our, uh, our institutional fork so that we can have scientists run um, their regression tests, which is essentially all we have at that level um, on the code that they may be uh, using there for uh, their changes. The regression tests are limited because they are actively trying to change the answer. So uh, we do start to run into some spaces where, you know, we, we don't have unit tests or any other level of testing to fall back on. So it becomes pretty limited in, in the tools that, that we have for a lot of these scientific codes. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Well, can you get to the mic? That would help. Um, one way that we've kind of limited that in our climate modeling system is we've actually started putting in requirements that went, because we totally understand that domain scientists are actively trying to change and improve their answer. But in the development process, we advocate, and it's becoming a rule for us that everything needs to be behind switches. So their whole development process even if it's fixing a bug, they might get annoyed. We're still saying the answers remain the same. You do kind of run into issues if it's you add a branch somewhere. Sometimes the optimizer and the compiler will still change the answer on you. Um, but typically, we're able to back out the same answers through reduced optimization flags, which we then use through our regression testing that tests a bunch of different experiments in our system over like we do like a seven day simulation and then check the bit pattern at the end. And so it's been using those flags that has made it, and people are getting quite on board with that, even our domain scientists. And it's, it is working quite well. It can be kind of painful. And as a technical group, you then need to be mindful of like in making sure you remove those flags when you update the release, which is gonna update the answers. So there's, that's just one way we've been handling that in the climate modeling group. Any other questions? I have one more comment. Um, I'm going to be talking about testing after the break, and and that kind of addresses some of these. It's a real uh, confidence boost when you put in code changes and you see that the tests are working, and some of that can help um, overcome those barriers to, to merging code. Uh, but also, I've seen projects like uh, like with AMD building software that 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 wants to become merged into LLVM. And you have two different organizations with different goals, and in that case, you really have to look at you know what are the alignment, where, where's the narrative that aligns our goals together as organizations, and can we track the requests and the features that that we have at a high level to try and build that communication that has to happen in order to make the, the merges work. 
Trilinos is another project uh, that has a good example of kind of a federation of projects inside of it that have been able to do those sorts of things. Simple question, how's Git one? You know, when I started, I was using CVS and then version, I was like, oh, this solves all the problems. And then I switched to Git and I was like, this is great. Is it has a one? I mean, I stopped really watching the space. So I stopped worrying about. It. I'll just say there's, and maybe Git can do this, and we don't aware of it. But there's one situation where a lot of times we'll have Git repos, but we'll only need a subset, a small subset, and apparently. Subversion is the tool we have to use to do that. Get itself will grab the whole thing. So, yeah, yeah. So, but otherwise, gets all of us. And I guess we'll have to take a poll on that. So, um, we'll so get there to. There aren't any questions online, just so you know. Um, also, um, so we're going to continue on with the tutorial. Um, we'll we'll continue on for about another fifteen minutes before lunch break, and then we'll we'll continue it on and finish it up right after lunch.